Hello. Hello. How are Hi. you? Good. It's, how are you? Good. It's so good to have you with us. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome, and thank you for the invitation. Of course, of course. We're. I mean, I. I'm a big fan. I've been following you for a while, but. Um, thank you. I know. I know. With all these virtual performances, everyone's extra excited about what you do. So many virtual performances, right? Yes. I mean, it's like the new normal. It's so strange. Um, it is. I didn't is. think that I'd be busier during quarantine than, than not. <laughs> right? Right? I feel like I, I completely agree. The At first, when it started, everyone was like, oh, everyone has extra time. And all these videos, all these performances, it's a lot of work. <laughs> Let's not forget. It's yeah. we're getting used to it. It um, is. It's a lot of work. Um, and it's sort of um, tricky because we have we have five people in this home who are all sharing this space. And this is like the prime space. This is where everything happens. The living room is where the piano is. I was it's just like, thinking about that, actually. I was yeah. like, I wonder if that's the living room. <laughs> this is like the prime sort of like, you know, family space. Yeah. So every time I have an online or even if I just have to uh, film myself singing something, um, my kids have to go on a walk. <laughs> right. <laughs> because they're so little, they don't, they can't, I can't tell them to be quiet, you know? Yeah. It's like they're, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, like the nine-year-old's fine, but the three and the one-year-old, they're they don't, they shouldn't have to be told to be quiet. So they go on a walk. And yeah. um, well, if they see you, they're gonna ask you for things, <laughs> inevitably. Yeah. yeah. And some of them like my singing and some of them don't like my singing. <laughs> I saw you posted a story re recently when you were studying that your yeah. little one, was, that was very cute. I mean, Every time she's in the room and I start to practice, she's, she screams, don't do that! Why would you do that? <laughs> this is really funny. Um, yeah, but then she'll make me sing to her for like, you know, a half an hour before I put her to bed. So she probably she likes, likes I mean, I, I assume that when they're so little, they like the softer, softer singing. I guess maybe you're... Your vibrating high notes are a little too loud. Much for <laughs> exactly. I think that's actually a thing. I mean, I don't think kids really like those those really loud sounds. Um, <laughs> so it, yeah, understandable. Understandable. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was telling everyone that we're so excited to have you as our guest that we're leaving some time at the end for a Q and A. So. Right. Um, so people, if questions pop up, we'll get to them by the end, but, um, how about we get started with the right. questions that we have? Let's so go. as we were saying, all these virtual performances have brought to light your excellent self-accompanying skills. Uh, and, um, you. I mean, this was no news for me. <laughs> you know, when you came out at the Met at Home Gala, I was like, oh, I know she's amazing. <laughs> but a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, that are used to maybe from around the world seeing you in the Met in HD broadcast, maybe they didn't know this about you. So, um, what can you say about your musical education and yeah. how, yeah, how has this given you this in the independence? You know, it has given me a lot of independence. Um, my first instruments were the voice and then you know I sang when I was like a baby um and then violin and piano mm -hmm. and um I didn't really get serious about anything except the piano and um voice came like much later so um piano is like my first real passion mm -hmm. and I had hoped to study it in my undergrad um I actually went to Eastman as a voice major, um, but while I was there, I auditioned to study with Doug Humphreys, uh -huh. um, and he took me on as a student, and I studied with him for two years, really enjoyed it, 
Um, he was very nice to take me on as a student. Um, and I had an overuse injury. I, I got tendonitis and I got cubital tunnel syndrome in both of my arms. And um, I had to stop playing. Mm. So um, I had to, it was really, I was hit hard. Yeah. I had to um, really put it on the table for a while. And it was a, a blessing in disguise, I think. At the time, I really um, was trying to do too much. And mm -hmm. I was really, it was good for me to really focus on the voice and to um, develop what I needed to develop. But, you know, while I was playing at Eastman, I was accompanying singers. And mm -hmm. I think I accompanied a singer from each of the voice studios. So I get to sit in all, the, all of their lessons. I got yeah. to learn from every single teacher. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, it was like, I didn't do that on purpose, but it was like, I got to sort of eavesdrop and learn all these different points of view. Mm -hmm. um, my teacher was Carol Weber. Mm -hmm. She was phenomenal. I loved her. Um, she did so much for me. And she helped me to make that transition from being a pianist into being a singer. Mm -hmm. um, so there were a lot of things that I needed to learn. I needed to figure out how to communicate with my face and with my, my whole body, right? And yeah. I needed to um, really face my audience and understand that I was, you know, I was there with a message for them. Um, that's something that I had sort of hid behind when I was playing piano and, um, and accompanying is sort of like, you know, even one step further in that direction where you don't have to be sort of like the face of. Right, alone. Of in the production. The, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so this was a really important step for me to take and Carol really helped me there. Um, and I, I mean, I loved the text. I loved discovering the storytelling aspect of this. Um, what I thought was interesting though, is my, my piano teacher, Doug Humphreys, he really related singing to the study of the piano. And I thought that was kind of brilliant. You know, he, he talked about how when you, when you play a piece on the piano, you're also telling a story. Mm -hmm. And you're also singing and you, um, you have to think of it in that sort of theatrical way as, as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the two disciplines really sort of informed each other. And um, I think that was, it was a really important part of my development as a musician. Of course, I love being able to learn my accompaniments and just, you know, it makes the learning process so much faster mm. um, and it makes my understanding of what's happening in the orchestra always a lot faster and um, I'm yeah I'm, I'm really grateful I have this skill and you know I put it away for so long and really focused on my voice but it didn't mean that I couldn't go back to it later mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know whenever I feel like, you know, after, after I had a certain amount of healing in my arms, um, I was able to go back to it and I, you know, play all the time now. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> it's funny. In one of my, in one of my lessons with Professor Humphreys, he said to me, so what do you want to do with this singing and piano thing? <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, I think someday it would be really cool to like accompany myself in a recital. Yeah, there you go. And to like <laughs> that day take is that today. On. And he was sort of surprised at he but he was like, you know what? I would buy a ticket to that. <laughs> it's like I would go see that show. Yeah. <laughs> so he was really That's amazing. Mm -hmm. He was really encouraging, and like I, I never thought that I'd actually get to that, <laughs> that, that they would have come. to do it. I'm like, I have to do it now. <laughs> really, it's fun. It's fun. Um, now, when you're preparing your roles, at what point uh, do you go to a pianist? You know, do you stop right. accompanying yourself and actually yes. go to a pianist? 
Yes, and this is a really important point, I think. Um, you can't just sort of like dive in and do it all at once. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually talking to Brian Waghorn about this. I don't know if you're listening, Brian, but um, <laughs> he is, Brian is of course one of our fantastic um, assistant conductors at the Met. Yeah. And accompanies all singers um, marvelously. And he's like so, so good at playing and singing at the same time in a coaching. Mm -hmm. And he sings all the parts. And I mean, all the coaches at the Met do this. Mm -hmm. And I've always been very impressed by that skill um, because it's not only one part, they're sort of like jumping around and singing all the other parts. <laughs> um, and we were talking about how this is like such a hard thing to do and how the process really is to isolate each instrument, right? Mm -hmm. You have to isolate each part. And so you can get into a lot of trouble. I can get into a lot of trouble if I sing and accompany myself simultaneously too soon. Mm. Um, there's a lot of things about playing that are not necessarily conducive to great singing. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, you're sitting down. It's not necessarily like the best way to learn. It can be a fine way to learn to vocalize and to, you know, um, to learn a piece. But if you're not really attentive, you can get some bad habits, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I have to really focus on each instrument alone. Uh -huh. And the things that I've been presenting in the last two months have been the kind of pieces that like are pretty much memorized. Um, so I cannot be looking for, you know, where does the left hand go? I just, I can't if I'm singing and playing at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It absolutely has to be the kind of piece that you know so well that yes. you can just think about the things that you want to think about. You can think about character. You can think about your audience connection. You can think mm -hmm. about the words. And um, so that's key. I think that... Um, as a lot of us are starting to try to do this in the current climate, which is kind of necessary and, yeah. and awesome. I love seeing people, you know, lots of people are tagging me and, and saying, look, I'm doing this awesome <laughs> thing that, that you inspired me to do. And I think that's so great. But I would just say like word of caution, be really careful that you isolate each instrument and mm -hmm. only present stuff that is fully thought through technically, mm -hmm. musically, and that then you put it together. Mm -hmm. um, okay. so that you're used to sitting down at this piano bench and supporting, and you are used to the combination of all the things you have to coordinate. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Great, great. That's a great insight. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> We have a couple of questions coming in, but we'll get to them later. Okay. So I wanted, I'm going to change that. topics a little bit. Sure. Um, so the other big thing about you is that you're, I mean, we already know you're a superwoman <laughs> with, with your skills, but also because you have a family with three amazing kids. And um, I mean, I think a big question for everyone is, how do you make it all work? How do you make this balancing act possible? And yeah. if you might, I was wondering if you might have some advice for young artists who might be envisioning a career and who might feel a little overwhelmed at this idea of, you know, having this risky career, but also wanting to build a family. What can you tell us about right. that? This is the number one question I get asked mm -hmm. all the time because it's the universal like sort of golden question. Um, you know, everybody wants to have it all. And I, you know, feel like it's, it's this sort of mystery how to balance work and, and life. And um, obviously for every person, this is going to look different. Mm -hmm. So what I have done is not necessarily right or better, um, but I will tell you my experience. Um, for me, um, having three kids has enabled my career 
and enabled me to sort of like become the woman that I want to be um, as a whole rather than hindered it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one really important attitude to adopt if you're going to try to do this. Mm -hmm. um, you have to um, recognize the ways in which, you know, being a parent is um, really, it just, for me, it has been um, the thing that really makes me responsible and makes me sort of take care of myself better. Um, I always do way better when I'm traveling with my kids than without, because I sort of need them to um, sort of keep me on track, you know, mm -hmm. sleeping right and eating right and all of those sort of basic things that mm -hmm. have a big effect on how we perform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, besides that, they just like sort of give me life in a way that I need in order to get on stage and share with people the kind of, you know, light that I want to share. They're giving it to me. I don't know. I mean, I think you, you have to have, that has to come from the people you love. It has to come from um, the, you know, real life experiences that you're having. And my kids have really done that for me. Um, so there's that. Um, the other really important thing is that um, I chose a partner who has been completely willing and able to share the load and to support what I'm doing. Um, we are really 50-50 in this, in this marriage, in this like whole um, company business, the uh, family business. Yeah. It's like we're running a company um, mm -hmm. and we really have to be 50-50. Now that ebbs and flows. Um, there are times, I mean, you really have to be flexible. My husband, has a very demanding career himself. Mm -hmm. um, he's a law professor at Yale, mm -hmm. and he, um, he has a demanding job, but a flexible job. Mm -hmm. So um, we take turns, and mm -hmm. especially in quarantine, <laughs> we're yes. very much like we are passing the baton to each other because you know, it's sometimes by the hour, like, I have a thing now. I have a thing. Right. Yes. So yeah. it's kind of, oh, that's my garage. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, now the kids are outside um, running through the sprinklers and getting things out of the garage. So um, it's such a beautiful day. Um, so anyway, that's key. Um, my husband has been like completely on board from day one um, of supporting this career, like in all ways. Mm -hmm. um, and he has a much more stable job than I, right? I mean, freelancers don't have the kind of security, especially in a pandemic. <laughs> oh, yes. um, so there, there's that element of support too, mm -hmm. um, which I have found has really helped me in times when I've had a lull in my career or when I've had, um, or when I've I've been pregnant and I've had to take a little step back mm -hmm. and time off. My husband has really, you know, enabled a lot of this career to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's that. I think um, it's been, it's not like I woke up one day and I had three kids in an international career. You know, it's been a really long, slow, process of building this and mm -hmm. learning and actually this might like you know shock some people but I found it to be easier to have more than one child um mm -hmm. having one child was a, a huge adjustment and we had like the, the learning curve was really steep um and then you know we had our second and we felt like we had, you know, given our first a friend and all of a sudden it was easier because they had this had like, something to do. <laughs> they had <laughs> and they don't need you 24 seven in the same mm. way because they have this like built in friend. Mm. Um, now going from two to three is like, I mean, it's a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like, 
we're really, really busy, um, especially considering their ages. You know, my, number two and number three are really close in age. They're 21 months apart. So um, that's really, it's been like two years of changing diapers and yeah. running, running after children and like trying to, you know, it's really been busy. It's a lot of work, but as they get older, I'm seeing how the the idea of them having each other is just it's really important it's mm -hmm. not that like i have nothing to do anymore <laughs> not at all um but they just really feed off of each other in a way mm -hmm. that's that's really beautiful and important and mm -hmm. i find it easier to travel with three kids than i did with one kid mm. much more expensive <laughs> right 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 i mean like my housing is like but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but it's it's easier sort of on everyone emotionally because we have each other, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I mean, you might. I'm I'm not exactly sure their ages, but are, are you planning on homeschooling on schooling schooling that? Because yeah. I know that's a whole other story. That is so. For the moment, I'm homeschooling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> not by choice. Um, yeah, so my kids are nine, three, and one. Okay. And um, so we have had, you know, my nine-year-old has been in school since mm -hmm. kindergarten. Um, mm -hmm. She's been in a private school that allows her some flexibility. Mm. Um, we are changing up the model this year. We oh, are yeah. actually um, moving to New Canaan. And we're going to be in in public school, so we're um, we're, you know, gonna see how that goes. And um, what we've had so far, like up until pandemic times, mm -hmm. we've had um, the flexibility to be able to travel as a family when we need to, and it's been great. And um, my, you know, my kids have been reasonably. Um, adaptable and they've been you know, they've loved going to other countries and I mean what an education for them yeah it's been yeah. really good um as they get older it's more important for them to have sort of like that consistency and they want to be in school more mm -hmm. um and my daughter who's nine has now traveled with me to some places a few times so it's no longer like new and cool um, although she's I already know it. that city. <laughs> it's so crazy. I mean, this is what I hate to even say this, but like, she's kind of like, she's not over it, but <laughs> she's definitely more concerned with mm -hmm. maintaining her relationships at her home. Friends with her and, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Which is yeah. understandable. And so I'm, I'm trying to give my kids that. Um, and then, you know, I'll probably have to travel on my own a little bit more. We're going to see how it goes. Part of how this works is staying flexible and figuring it out. Yeah. So, yeah. Totally. Totally. It's thank you for that answer. I think it's, it's helpful to everyone to kind of have an idea of the possibilities, you know? Right. Yeah. People do that so many different ways. Yeah. Yeah. So since we were touching on, on your career, um, and you mentioned that it's been a slow, you know, process and something that's been building up. But I was wondering, because a lot of young artists, you know, or even maybe even younger than young artists, when people are in school, they have this idea, you know, that there's one moment that's going to define everything and where they're going to make it, whether, you know, a moment, a competition that defines whether you make it or not. I know. And I was wondering what what was your experience uh, on that aspect? What uh, what you had to say about that? If you feel like you had a certain moment like that in your career, or if it's been really something gradual. So I've had a lot of moments that have pushed me to the next level, mm -hmm. um, that have put me in the spotlight a little bit. But I would say that the overnight success is sort of a myth. Mm. This is a, this is always um, the story you read in the news. Um, but the truth behind it is always 
very slow, very boring practice. <laughs> you know, it's not glamorous. It's not. It's not even close to being glamorous. And then, and then, um, and then you have like you know a few moments in your career that are like super duper glamorous. <laughs> um, I mean, for me, the first sort of breakout moment was when I sang Marguerite de Valois in The Huguenots at Bard. Mm -hmm. That was 2009. Um, and I was still in the Lindemann program when that happened. Mm -hmm. um, so it was pretty early. And I was, you know, really grateful for that opera, for that opportunity. Thad Strasberger was the production um, director. And it was mm -hmm. so brilliant. It was such a good production. Um, and fabulous cast. That was a great moment. And then I think, um, you know, of course, stepping in as Sophie was a big moment at the mm -hmm. Met. Um, but here's the thing about that, Sophie. I found out like two days before opening night, right? Yeah. But I was prepared, right? I mean, I had already covered that role at the Met in the old production, right? I had covered it when Susan Graham and Renee Fleming and Christina Schaefer, well, it was Chris, Christina Schaefer and Mia Persson split the role and I was covering both of them. So I got to watch these fantastic Sophies and this yeah. just like marvelous cast. Um, I, and Kristen Siegmundson was ox, like, such a fabulous cast to watch. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was like years before, a few years before. And then I, you know, was ready. I was really ready by the time that call came. And I think that's what young singers really need to keep in mind. When the call comes, you, have, right. you have to be yeah. prepared. And if you're not, then it's really not a great thing for you to be pushed into the limelight it's not mm -hmm. all about the press it's mm -hmm. about how you do <laughs> yeah right yeah. so yeah I wouldn't wish for those moments to really happen as much as I would just like really accept that it's like really a long boring process of working <laughs> it just is yeah yeah well and I I'm glad you mentioned that because there's also what makes a career is also leaving the ego aside, you know, and if you're not prepared for something, instead of jumping into something that might hinder you, yeah. you know, maybe say like, okay, I'll, I'll pass or right. like, or try to be ready is, for something. But this is such an important point too, uh, when it comes to auditions. Mm -hmm. um, my fabulous teacher, Edith Burrs, um, she was my teacher at Judith, uh, at, at Juilliard and mm -hmm. at, um, when I was in the Lindemann program. So, you know, years and years of studying with her and, um, she was very careful with me about which auditions I accepted and which I didn't. Mm -hmm. And if I was sick that morning, it was mm -hmm. cancel the audition. And it was like, you know, really hard for me to do that sometimes. But she was, she was always saying to me, you have one chance to make a first impression. Mm. Don't throw something out there that they're going to remember yeah. that is not up to par, that it's mm -hmm. not representative of your best. Mm -hmm. um, so I've tried, I mean, I try to pass on that advice um, to young singers too. I, I think it really is important to be, um, to be careful what you put out there. Mm -hmm. Make sure that it's really completely prepared. Um, yeah, especially when you're in the audition process at that mm -hmm. stage in your career. Yeah, yeah. Great advice, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so going a little bit into <laughs> repertoire, you're a coloratura soprano, light lyric, how has your voice and repertoire evolved with time? Are there roles that you sang when you were studying that you still sing? Are you moving on past certain roles? And looking ahead, obviously maybe 2021 and ahead, are there particular roles and projects that, you know, might be the views that you're uh, excited about that you could share with us? Yeah, um, I might be like a really big disappointment on this question because 
I, um, my voice hasn't changed that much um, since like 10 years ago. And I think that everybody expects when you've had a child and with each child, they, they sort of expect your voice to get thicker and to get warmer. And I think maybe it has a little bit, um, but not in like a really dramatic way. Um, and so I think that's, um, I think that's important. Um, I think that it's not obvious that um, a Zofi will one day sing a Marshallin. I think mm -hmm. it's not, um, it's not necessarily the case that Adela will end up singing Rosalinda one mm -hmm. day. I think that like, if your voice doesn't change that much, it's okay. Um, totally. But I think I'm under the impression that uh, a lot of coloratura, you know, real coloratura and lighter voices um, kind of mature a little earlier and they remain like that. And that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I think yeah. it's so individual. I think it will be different for every person. Mm -hmm. um, I have noticed that some things are, you know, sustaining long legato lines is a little easier for me than it used to be. Um, so there is a little bit of change there. And I, I think that, you know, now I feel maybe a little more comfortable singing roles like Gilda, um, mm -hmm. which um, in the beginning when I started singing Gilda, it felt good, but it didn't feel like where I wanted to live all the time. Okay. So I've had to be careful not to schedule it too often, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one a year or like one every six months max. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I even put it away for a while um, because I just, I didn't want to lose the light sparkly qualities to my voice. Yeah. So um, delving into heavier repertoire is a tricky business. You have to be really careful about it. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, you know, uh, it's tempting to say yes to projects that are exciting roles and exciting, like, characters. Um, but I think young singers need to understand that casting directors don't always understand your voice, like, intimately. And that's maybe not even their fault. They're getting to know you. And they're throwing out ideas and you don't have to say yes to them. Mm -hmm. If it's the wrong project, your, your job is to then give them the right idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's to yeah. give them better ideas. Yeah. Um, so I think young singers need to take charge of that a little bit more. And I, you know, um, for instance, okay. So next year, about a year from now, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be doing uh, a tour with um, the Staatskapelle Dresden and Thielemann. And it's the, um, oh, my daughter's friend is calling. Hold on. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be right back. Okay. Hilarious. Sorry, there's iPads all over the place. I love it. Um, this is like, it's we're like alive, device, we're alive. device heaven, device heaven, because, oh, yes, ay, ay, ay. Um, oh, I see this comment, sometimes saying no is about self-preservation. Yes, you get it. Um, yeah, and so, for instance, um, the Staatskapelle asked me to sing the Brentano leader, mm -hmm. which is um, such a fantastic song cycle. Um, these orchestral songs, right? These Strauss songs that are so great, but the final song is really heavy, um, the Lied der Frauen. And so I suggested that we do something else instead. Mm -hmm. um, and they were so cool with it, just like completely fine with it. Um, that's like you know, how the negotiations should go. Um, and I think just young singers need to be less afraid of of you know saying this might not be right for me and yeah don't be afraid of losing the job i think they respect a singer who knows their voice and they are asking you to help them get to yes. know you yes yes 100 percent. 
Yeah. Wonderful. So we're getting a lot of questions. So I'm going to, okay. there's one more question that I want to touch on and then we'll move, move on to all these wonderful questions that I'm seeing. Okay. So I wanted to touch a little bit on the current situation. And since it's such a tricky time for, for artists and performers, I wanted to know if you had um, certain advice uh, for artists everywhere, you know, on staying focused and motivated during this time? And a little bit, how has this experience been for you? Um, the thing that I find myself um, thinking and sharing a lot with like different groups on Zoom and, and um, master classes that I've dropped in on Mm -hmm. The thing that I have been thinking the most about is just that we're sort of in a state of um, destruction where we feel like things are crumbling around us. The antidote to destruction is creation, right? Yes. Yeah. And this is how I'm sort of getting through this time is by creating something. I have to sort of be in a forward moving state, I have to be progressing. And so we need to use the limitations that are placed on us right now and let that push us to find creative new ways of sharing art and of creating art and inventing art. I think we've seen some really cool things. Yeah. Um, Ryan McKinney is like, self-producing music videos that are yeah. both hilarious mm -hmm. and super moving. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of um, baton passing, keep the music going, pass the song from Sasha Cook. Um, let's just talk about the Met Gala. I mean, it was like... It was amazing, when, truly, when, yeah. The, when the Met chorus came on and sang Va Pensiero, I, I literally started crying yeah um because i was so moved that we're all separated and all giving this like new medium a chance and feeling connected nonetheless yeah um and the music was it was stunning even through devices it was stunning and i think that's it's really important to note that even though we can't perform for live audiences in person, that our music can still be powerful. It can still have an impact and it's still important to share it. Um, I sing every day as a form of self-care. It's what I have to do for my soul. I'm, I mean, of course, I'm trying to sort of like keep my skills up. Um, but it is really coming from like a sort of need to stay healthy mentally mm -hmm. to um um and so i'm doing it for myself but i'm also doing it because i know other people need it mm -hmm. um one of the most one of the hardest days of this all for me was the day that the met closed because i was there um and so, you know, I'm there and I'm getting a costume fitting and then I'm walking downstairs and I see people exiting the building and it's, I was like, oh, it happened. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't leave. I had to like, I was just like, I had to sort of sit down for a second in a dressing room and be like, what's going to happen next? Um, yeah. Yeah. That was one of the hardest days. Um, and... The thing that I kept thinking was, but we need music in, in states of crisis. We need the music to, to help heal us. Um, and so I think that's what has been motivating me on a daily basis is just that the world is a place that, that, um, that really needs these sort of cathartic musical experiences right now. And so if we can't bring it to them in the traditional ways, we have to sort of 
let our egos down a little bit and do things in a different way and experiment before the world. I mean, that's what the Met Gala was. Mm -hmm. It was scary. It was so scary. Um, you know, I, I was nervous. I was so nervous. I was like, oh my God, is everything going to work? I, I, was I know. So like, <laughs> yes, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, I know. Um, and, and then you sort of accept a call and you see that you're, you know, in a waiting room and then, you know, there's Jonas Kaufmann singing before you. It's like, oh, okay. Um, and I'm just sitting in my living room. <laughs> it's so bizarre because it's both, yes. you're both reaching like a gazillion people at once, but also it's this very intimate mm -hmm. thing where you're inviting people into your living room and it's more yeah. casual than regular opera, right? Than, yeah. than, than what we're used to. So it's, um, it's a new world that we were like seriously just diving into that day. Yeah. Um, I thought it was just such a, an important moment for the Met and for music. So I was just proud of the Met that day. I was proud of everybody. And um, I thought that was a really important step. This is the time to try new things. It's the time yeah. to figure out how to like self-produce things because mm -hmm. we can't rely on each other quite in the same way. Um, you know, making music by yourself in front of your phone is not that fun. And we have to figure out ways to, um, to do it anyway. We have to, yeah. we yeah. have to um, figure out how to make it fun, you know? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Could not agree more. And hopefully I think from all these experiments, some of it will stick. <laughs> Babies, sorry. <laughs> we have 15 minutes 15 minutes tell them 15 minutes <laughs> thank you 15 um, the uh, two -year -old doesn't understand this quite yet. so yeah I mean my hope is that you know with all these experiments some of it will stick some of it will be more tools that you will be able to use in the future as well as going back to the theaters yeah, um, I think so too. Yeah, I think also when we go back to the theater, it's going to be like incredible. I know. It's, it's going to be this. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just going to be this amazing. I, I hope that we all sort of look at it in a different way and that we appreciate the experience that it is to feel that energy. Um, I have said a couple of times that when I do a live performance, from my home when it's online, but it's live. It's it's a it means so much more mm -hmm. um, than recording something and then sending it in. It's really hard for me to do that, um, but to do it live, even though I can't see the audience, I really like feeling the energy that comes from knowing people from all over the place are tuning in, be tuning yeah. in, and then. What's really kind of weird, but nice too, is to read the comments after. And that's sort of like the new applause, right? Yeah, yeah. You don't, it's, it's very sad that that's how it's, um, how it's done now, but like, it's weird to perform and not hear the reactions of the audience, to not hear their, you know, the sigh of, their breath after a, a, a song is finished. It's, mm. it's really strange to not feel, um, to not actually witness those things. And mm. so it becomes more important to, to, you know, talk about your experience and to share it online. Yeah. 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 Oh, wonderful. Thank you for that. So I'm going to dive into all these questions. Hopefully yeah. we can get through a lot of them. Let's see. Uh, uh, so this we touched on. Um, let's see this one. So how do you deal with self-criticism and the pressure to do a perfect take while recording at home? Oh, this is oh my very gosh. Timely. Yeah, I'm kind of the worst. <laughs> I've done the worst. I've done, I mean, I'm the worst with this. I, I, I think I, it took me like five hours to record that New York Times clip. 
because um you know i just it i i just wanted it to be perfect um anyway i think this is a really good question self criticism in general i mean it's useful and to the extent that it is useful then take it the moment it becomes destructive throw it out the door mm -hmm. um but i do think that some level of self criticism is healthy and kind of necessary um to putting out a good product i do um obviously we can't be too hard on ourselves um i think when you're doing a film that you have to send in one thing that that has helped me is to call somebody is to facetime like my parents who are musicians <laughs> and to say can i do a test on you can i so that i have an audience yeah and um that i it just sort of maintains the sort of life and the um the feeling that there's a conversation yeah So for instance for the New York Times thing I did that the night before I called my parents and you know I said how does this seem to you and and um it was like a sort of dress rehearsal I really liked the um the experience of performing it for someone it informs how I go about you know filming it yeah. so um it has to feel as much as possible like a conversation mhm mm mhm mm Good. That's great. Thank you so much. Because I mean, everyone's making videos right now, so yeah. that's really a great tip. Let's see. Uh, oh, this one probably applies to a lot of people. How do you start working on new repertoire to not be overwhelmed? Right. So one. So for for one thing, I'm not working on new rep right now because mm -hmm. I just simply don't have the time. Mm -hmm. um you know i haven't had childcare for 2 months <laughs> so my my husband and i are really just taking turns with the kids um all of the things i've been performing right now are things that i know i have known for a long time um when i do work on new rep i think that the key is step by step like have a list I mean I'm so very boring about these things but if I have a list that I can just say first is translate the opera second is play through the score you know or or find a recording mm -hmm. um don't get married to that recording but just listen through to it right mm -hmm. um the next step would be to look at your own text and to you know put words to music Um if I'm really super boring and methodical about it then it's then it it's not overwhelming. Um give yourself enough time to do it. Mm. Do not panic at the last minute and do not put it off and then you know it just learning music on crunch time is just not conducive to to how it's it's supposed to feel. Um so that's key i mean give yourself enough time to not be overwhelmed um something that i used to do but i haven't had time to do recently but is that when you're when you're learning something for the first time i i i do uh, the entire the entire role on a lip trill mm. like just no words just rhythms and notes on a lip trill to mm. to train your voice what these pitches are and in the yeah. relationship between the pitches. Um yeah. Yeah, great, fantastic. So, let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, this is nice. Is Mrs. Morley Ms. Morley aware that her performance at the At Home Gala was perceived as beyond impressive? That's very sweet. <laughs> very sweet. thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> the uh, uh 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 so how do you navigate planning projects multiple years in advance mm -hmm. 
Yeah, this is super tricky, especially when you have kids. Um, I think it was Jonas Kaufman who did a really important interview about this a few years ago. There was a big article mm -hmm. in the Times where he said, this is, this is like an impossible process where they ask me to do something five years from now, and I don't know if I'm going to want to do that role five years from now. Right. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, planning projects that far in advance is tricky. I think um, the only thing that I can do is um, ask myself if I would want to do it now mm. and if I would want that schedule now. Okay. It's impossible to project. Mm. Um, so, and I, my husband uses the same sort of um, uh, baseline for, for accepting um, gigs in his world too. Mm -hmm. um, would I want to do it now? Would I want to get on a plane and go there now? Um, yeah. Would yeah. I want to stay in Europe for four months at a time and then come back home now? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so... Um, yeah, it's impossible to project. You don't know where yeah. your kids are going to be. You don't know what their needs are going to be. Um, you don't know what your voice is going to want to sing in five years. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Sometimes you have to take a leap of faith and try something. Yeah. But just don't schedule too many of those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Let me scroll because we got a lot here. Uh, this is a good one. What tips could you share to pregnant singers? She is, Angela is six months pregnant to keep okay. developing the voice. Did you have a recovery period after delivery? What was that like? Hmm. Super good question. Um, I could talk for a really long time about singing in pregnancy and singing in postpartum periods. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing. It's going to be different for every person. Um, but what I learned with my first child um, was that it helped me through my pregnancy to sing every day. Okay. Um, the, the concepts of good singing are really helpful to a healthy pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and sort of vice versa. I mean, all the wonderful advice that all of my midwives and doctors would give me were conducive to good singing. Mm -hmm. um, I found singing to be really helpful in my second and third babies, um, even up until delivery. I sang through my entire labor with my second child, and it really helped me to deal with my contractions because mm -hmm. singing well requires you to find a really deep connection with your breath. Mm. It requires you to, even just the, the concept of, of um, facing fear, that moment when you step on stage and you find that your breath starts getting really shallow and high and you say no and you deepen and you find it and then you're fine. I found that doing that during my labor and delivery was really important. Mm. Every time I felt that tinge of fear, mm. I dropped my breath and I allowed mm. the experience to happen, right? Yeah. Um, so sing every day, let your singing help you through the process. Um, if I could say something very general, um, breathing through the back, is really great during pregnancy. It's like the only place you can find your breath because there's so much happening in front. Um, and then after the baby's born, um, every, you know, every person's going to need a different recovery period. I found that it was really helpful for me physically to start singing again really slowly. Mm -hmm. um, I started, you know, 10 days after my delivery to just do very, very gentle breathing exercises and to start getting back in physical shape. And then, um, you know, if you're singing every day up until you deliver your baby, then it's much easier 
to go back to, go back. to the baby's born. Mm -hmm. Your body goes through so many mind blowing changes that if you sort of take your voice along during that journey, it will be mm -hmm. a lot easier to meet your voice back yeah. on the other yeah. end. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful, wonderful advice. Um, let's see. Let us scroll back. Um, so many good questions. Hi, everybody. So many great questions. Uh, oh, here, this is cool. Can Erin comment on women's voices that might be zwischen Fach mm -hmm. and all of the crossovers some mezzos and sopranos are doing? Right. Um, you know, it's such an individual question. Um, I think I think that voice categories can be detrimental. They can be useful insofar that it helps us to feel like we're not, you know, um, less than if we have a small voice. Mm -hmm. Right, that it's not all about size. Yeah, but a lot of it has to do with other things. Um, but I think that um, beyond that, voice category is not necessarily helpful. Um, I mean, don't let anybody put you in a box. If you like singing Zerlina, then sing Zerlina. If you like singing Rosina, then sing Rosini. I mean, these are roles that we've seen like all different kinds of voices. Yeah. Um, I think that it's, uh, it's hard to sort of make a, a general statement about it because what I feel is that like anybody should be able to do anything and, um, or able, able to choose to do any, any role they want as yeah. long as it fits, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, let's see. No, I try to fit in as many. Let's see. Uh, oof, this is a heavy one. <laughs> Do you have any tips for young singers who want to begin their careers after COVID? I mean, in a way- We have two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. In a way, it's a great time to start your career. You know, I mean, when I, um, graduated from Eastman, I, I took some time off to do life stuff because that's a great time to do life stuff. And, and we're given this gift right now of yeah. time yeah. Um, in most cases. And, and, and for me, I'm finding it to be really great to have time with my family right now um, and to not be sort of like racing all over the globe um, trying to do everything all at once. Um, I think that if you're in that transition period and you're about to start your career, um, I've already heard of some companies being really creative with how they're going to involve their young artists. Um, I know that the work will continue. Um, but I would also say that if life presents you with a break right now, accept it and you know, use it for all of the wonderful things that that is. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I hope that's helpful. Yes. No, um, it, it really is. And we all have so much work to do and so much studying to do anyway. So. Right. I mean, I would love to have the time to do that right now. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Thank you so much. This was so inspiring and so insightful. We're all very appreciative. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. And I'm going to post this on IGTV if anyone missed it. And great. Good luck. Thank you so much for thank your time. You. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. I really Bye, appreciate everyone. the quest.